coming in. All right, welcome to everyone coming in. We'll get started in just a minute here. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, it's 11 o'clock, so we'll get going while people are still sort of trickling in. Um, so welcome to today's Local Motion and Learning Network event. Uh, I'm Jonathan Weber. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm the Complete Streets Program Manager here at Local Motion. Um, today we're talking about e-bikes, and our goal is for everyone attending to come away with a solid understanding of e-bikes and how they fit into our transportation system. Um, so if you've got questions, please put those in the questions box and we'll get to them during our discussion at the end or uh, potentially throughout the presentation if we're doing well on time. Um, if you've got any technical issues, you can post those in the question box uh, or you can contact me with the info shown on the current slide and I'll do my best to help you out. Um, we do have Zoom's live transcription feature enabled. So if you want to see closed captioning, um, you should be able to enable that for yourself by selecting the live transcription button down on the Zoom toolbar. Um, this webinar is being recorded and that recording is going to be available for everyone to view um, shortly after we wrap up. So uh, for our presenters today, we've got Eliana Fox, Local Motions Program Coordinator, who oversees our e-bike lending libraries. Um, and AARP Vermont State President Linda Bowden, who is going to provide some perspective on what e-bikes mean for some of the folks that she works with. Um, and I will also personally be presenting. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Eliana. So that's just, um, that's what that live transcript button looks like. Um, if you want to have uh, subtitles or closed captions, uh, you can enable those on your screen. Uh, next slide. And just real quick about local motion, we're Vermont's uh, statewide advocate for active transportation, vibrant communities, and safe streets. And our mission is to make biking, walking, and rolling a way of life across Vermont. So uh, real quick, just to look at what we're going to cover. Um, so first off, just I want to mention our focus today is on sort of on-road and path use. We're not going to talk about e-mountain bikes. Those sort of come with their own set of issues. And uh, there are other organizations better suited that are more experts on, on that. Um, but we're going to talk about the various types of e-bikes and their uses, uh, sort of some of the benefits uh, and the support systems that are out there for e-bike adoption. Um, we'll look at some ridership trends and user profiles. Um, we'll also go over some of the infrastructure needs and some of the planning that kind of needs to be undertaken that's unique to e-bikes. Um, and finally, we'll look at some of the state and local e-bike regulations, as well as um, some of the sort of discussions around user conflict and the best practices for management. And uh, just real quick before we get into it, thanks to our partners, um, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, Go Vermont, and Burlington Electric um, all provide a lot of support for our e-bike programming generally. And um, the CCRPC and Go Vermont really help us uh, make uh, learning network events like this possible. So thanks to those partners. Um, and also to AARP for being here uh, for this webinar. And uh, Eliana can uh, take it from here. Um, thanks for the intro, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to start off by providing a basic anatomy of e-bikes. So for the most part, electrically assisted bicycles, also known as e-bikes, are pretty similar to conventional bicycles. Um, the main differences are that they come equipped with battery powered motors to provide the user with just the right amount of help. They come with a small screen display that usually has some combination of a speedometer, odometer, battery level, and pedal assist level controls. And lastly, e-bikes will have either cadence or torque sensors that tell the electric bike's pedal assist system when to engage the motor and propel the e-bike forward. 
Um, so for cadence-based pedal assist systems, like the one that's pictured here, um, the electric bike's motor is engaged when the rider begins to pedal forward. Uh, many e-bikes have anywhere from three to five available levels of pedal assist. Uh, at each of those levels, the motor will provide a prescribed amount of power in response to the signal from that cadence sensor. If the e-bike is class two, it will also have a throttle, usually on the left side of the handlebars. Um, and so Jonathan will tell you a bit more about e-bike classification uh, later on in the webinar. Um, so the two most common electric motor styles used in electric bicycles are hub motors shown on the left and mid-drive motors shown on the right. Both have a number of unique advantages and disadvantages, which I'll talk about now. So hub drive motors, which are usually found in the rear wheel, but sometimes in the front wheel of the e-bike, spin that bike's wheel. Hub drive motors are found more frequently on direct-to-consumer e-bike brands that can be purchased online. So some advantages of hub drives are that they are less expensive since they have fewer um, parts than mid-drive motors. However, this does not mean that they are any lower quality than those mid-drive motors. Uh, hub drives are generally more durable. Hub drive motors retain all of the, their components inside that motor casing, so that black part that you can see there, um, which kind of leaves less for the user to mess with or maintain. Um, hub drive motors cause less drivetrain wear. Um, since they don't connect to the main pedal drive system, hub drive motors don't add any extra stress to your chain or shifters and don't, don't cause any of those parts to wear out more quickly. Lastly, hub drive motors provide a second drive system if the bike has a throttle. Uh, this is because a hub drive directly applies torque to that wheel that it's in, operating independently of your bike's gears. So if the e-bike has a throttle and the battery still is juiced, a stranded rider will still be able to get home in the event of drive train issues, such as like a broken chain or something like that. And conversely, if the hub somehow fails for whatever reason, the rider can pedal back. So either way, you've got um, that backup system. Some disadvantages of hub drive motors are that they make it more difficult to remove the wheel that they're in. Um, so the wheel removal is more difficult with hub motors because you must disconnect the motor wire um, from the battery or wrestle around this wheel that is much heavier than a regular wheel while it's still tethered to the bike. Um, so this means that basic fixes like fixing a flat might be a little more difficult or, or time consuming. Um, additionally, hub drive motors limit the user's wheel and tire options. Um, so a, a user is limited to the rim that that hub motor comes on. So they might not be able to fit their favorite tire. And the width of that hub often means you can't fit a cassette, which is your collection of gears, um, of more than seven speeds. Um, and lastly, hub drive motors tend to feel less smooth than mid drive motors because they're spinning that rear wheel. So a common comment um, about hub drive motors is they can sometimes feel like they're pushing you as opposed to you pushing yourself under your own power. So the other common motor type on e-bikes are mid-drive motors, which spin an e-bike's drivetrain system instead of the wheel. Some advantages of mid-drive motors are that they have better weight distribution. So e-bike motors add weight to the e-bike, but being in the middle of the bike as opposed to the rear means that the weight of the motor is better distributed. Um, mid-drive motors also usually tend to be lighter than hub drive motors. Um, mid-drive motors also tend to feel smoother for the rider due to the use of torque sensors. Um, so mid-drive motors allow the use of torque sensors for pedal assist systems, which regulate the motor power based on how hard you push the pedals, as opposed to hub motors that rely on cadence, cadence sensors, um, which regulate motor speed based on pedal speed. Um, so that can cause kind of jerky or um, awkward timing. So some disadvantages of mid-drive motors are that they are generally more expensive. Um, there are a few e-bikes with mid-drive motors under $2,000, especially from well-known manufacturers. Um, the increased cost is due to the complexity of the system. You know, as I mentioned earlier, hub motors tend to have fewer moving parts. Um, one of the biggest issues with mid-drive motors is the increased stress and wear they cause on drivetrains. A mid-drive motor causes more wear on the drivetrain due to the additional torque placed on individual parts of the drivetrain, such as that chain and chain ring. However, bike manufacturers have e-bike specific parts that are heavier duty in order to address this additional wear. So it's something that they're super cognizant of. 
Um, and lastly, motor or drivetrain issues can leave a rider stranded um, as with a conventional bike. So for instance, if your chain happens to break while you ride on a mid-drive uh, bike, you're out of luck because the, both the motor and the pedals need the chain to drive the wheel. So now that you have an idea about the different types of electric motors that e-bikes have, we'll talk about different styles of e-bikes. E-bikes come in many different shapes and sizes. Here are two traditional or commuter style e-bikes. Again, very similar to conventional bikes, but include the battery motor and a small display. Um, you might notice that e-bikes tend to look a little bulkier than conventional bi bikes with components like wider tires. To me, this is really noticeable on this green specialized e-bike shown on the right. Um, so this is because the added weight from the motor and battery make the whole bike heavier, which would cause parts like the tires to wear faster. So as I mentioned earlier, manufacturers opt for spe specialty heavier duty or components um, for e-bikes. And these heavier duty components also add weight, which is why most e-bikes are gonna be usually 40 pounds, if not more. E-bikes also come in adaptive styles like this recumbent electric trike. Here you can see the motor in the hub of the front wheel. The premise is still the same in that the hub drive motor spins the wheel only on this trike, it spins the front wheel. And the setup with the motor in the front wheel makes a lot of sense because the weight of the motor in the front of the bike balances with the weight of the rider towards the rear of the trike. When it comes to carrying cargo with e-bikes, there are tons of different options. This modular Taga e-trike has a cargo area that can be changed up with or without kid seats, depending on whether the rider is carrying kids, cargo, or some combination of the two. Um, this e-trike has a tadpole style with two wheels in the front, um, which also makes it adaptive and more accessible. So for riders who may be older or hearing impaired, having that third wheel provides really helpful um, balance and stability. Some other styles of cargo e-bikes include this long-tailed cargo e-bike, which is on the right side of your, or the left side, um, and a front-loading bucket uh, on the right. As you can see, these styles of e-bikes can also be loaded up to carry kids, cargo, some combination of the two. Uh, these e-bikes can carry hundreds of pounds between the rider and the cargo. Um, one thing to note about these styles is that they are heavier. The long-tail cargo bike uh, is upwards of 70 pounds and the urban aero cargo bucket e-bike is probably 100 plus pounds, um, which makes that electric assist even more useful and helpful. Lastly, some cargo e-bikes are also being adopted in industrial spaces such as this one, uh, which can be used for hauling items such as landscaping equipment or otherwise. Um, another example of industrial cargo e-bikes you may have seen is with delivery companies like UPS, who has been testing out industrial cargo e-bikes in urban areas like New York City to reduce the congestion of uh, package delivery. Um, so really in a bunch of different spaces right now. So much like their different shapes, sizes, motor types, e-bikes come in a wide range of, in terms of costs as well. Um, an entry-level e-bike or conversion kit will be around 1K or more, um, and you'll usually only find these kinds of e-bikes um, that are this low cost from direct-to-consumer brands that can be purchased online. Um, in that second tier, you're going to see a typical commuter-style e-bike, um, which will be anywhere from $1,500 to $4,000. Uh, this will include, um, you know, those mid-drive commuter styles that I started out with. Um, but you'll seldom find an e-bike for less than $2,000 at any bike shop. Um, also in this price range, you'll find the more sophisticated direct consumer bikes, uh, like that long tail cargo e-bike. And in the most expensive category are full suspension mountain bikes and high-end road bikes that are equipped with batteries and motors, who, which are you know, expensive anyway, but you add the e-bike mo e motor and the battery and they are $5,000 if not more. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about e-bikes and the kinds of e-bikes that are out there, let's discuss some of the reasons why e-bikes are beneficial to our transportation system. So if increasing bicycle mode share is part of your community's active transportation or sustainability goals, consider supporting e-bike adoption. 
Um, in a 2018 survey of North American e-bike owners, approximately 7% of respondents reported that they did not ride a bicycle as an adult before owning an e-bike. Now, 94% of them reported um, using their e-bike weekly or daily. Um, and a second stat, in a 2015 study out of Norway, researchers found that e-bikes increase bicycle use in two ways, um, trip length and trip number. So the authors of that study found that e-bike users' trip lengths tended to be twice as long as those made by conventional cyclists, and that the average number of daily trips taken by e-bikers increased from 0.9 to 1.4. So also in that 2018 North American survey, e-bike owners were asked to report about the last three trips they made by e-bike and report the purpose and distance of that trip. The results showed that the most common trip types were for recreation and exercise, commute to work or school, and personal errands. For commute to work or school trips, e-bikes can replace car trips because they allow users to overcome the barriers of commute distances that might be too far or take too long by conventional bike. Um, as well as preventing the user from arriving to work sweaty or physically exhausted. Um, so data from our a survey of people who participated in our e-bike lending library program are somewhat similar. Um, when we asked our participants how much they would use an e-bike if they own one instead of a vehicle for a variety of activities, 33% of respondents reported that they would use the e-bike for daily exercise or recreation. 20% for daily personal errand trips and 16% for daily commuting trips. Um, and these trends are shown in the chart on the right-hand side of your screen, or the left-hand side of your screen, sorry, by the blue column for each trip type. So another potential car trip replacement that e-bikes address is the school drop-off and pickup. Um, school drop-off is a well-known time for traffic congestion. And with students recently returning to classrooms this fall, some schools are seeing even heavier traffic congestions as more parents are opting to drive children to avoid crowded buses. Um, E-bikes offer a solution for parents that gives them the ability to easily carry kids to and from school by bike. Uh, so just to give you an anecdotal example from a parent who borrowed um, a long tail cargo e-bike from our lending library, they said, quote, I was able to ride next to my first grader while my preschooler was in the bike seat. I was able to drop my first grader off at school on his own bike and then easily ride uphill to the next drop off with my preschooler in the bike seat and all of our gear in the pannier bag. And I was able to do it all in the same amount of time that I could with a car. Um, so we hear stories like that all the time of people who use cargo e-bikes. And as Linda will discuss later, younger adults tend to purchase these e-bikes and e-cargo bikes precisely because they help overcome this barrier of cargo or kid carrying. So e-bikes have huge benefits to our transportation systems through increasing bicycle use and replacing different types of trips that would otherwise be made by car. Um, so how can we help people make the switch to e-bikes? So you've heard me mention Local Motion's e-bike lending library programming, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the primary goals of our e-bike lending libraries are to expose people to this nascent mode and promote e-bikes as a mode of transportation. Participants go to our website, localmotion.org slash e-bikes um, and reserve an e-bike through our online system from a lending library that's closest to them. On the day of their reservations, participants pick up their reserved e-bike, which comes equipped with pannier bags, a lock and a charger. If they need it, we also provide helmets. If they are borrowing a long tail cargo bike, they also have the option to add kids seats if desired. Um, and then finally, on the last day of their loan period, participants return the e-bike and accessories. And lastly, uh, we send them a follow-up email that includes the link to our survey, as well as information about purchasing incentives. Um, and so giving people the opportunity to borrow e-bikes for multiple days at a time for free gives them time to try that school drop-off and pick-up or that work commute or trip to the grocery store, which you can't really do with a short-term shop ride or rental. Um, so how well does our e-bike lending library program work to achieve our goals of promoting e-bikes for transportation? Um, here's a chart from our 2020 participant survey. Um, a little over 70% of e-bike lending library participants reported that owning an e-bike would increase the frequency or distance of their transportation bike trips. Um, and many of these users go on to purchase e-bikes of their own. Um, and, you know, this is an awesome stat that 
scientific research supports. As I mentioned earlier, that Norway study found that e-bikers tend to make more trips by e-bike and the distances of those trips tend to be longer. So just to give this chart um, a little bit of context. As you learned at the beginning of this presentation, there are tons of different styles of e-bikes to choose from. Um, luckily in Vermont, we have V-Bike, which is a nonprofit organization in Brattleboro that's dedicated to shifting the bike and bike culture in Vermont towards a far more inclusive, fun, and transportation-oriented future. V-Bike director and founder, Dave Cohen, provides free consultations for individuals, families, and organizations so that they can make informed decisions about which e-bike uh, work, might work best for them and their transportation needs. And lastly, there are financial incentives to support e-bike adoption. Many Vermont utilities use their tier three funds to offer their customers $100 to $200 rebates for e-bikes purchased through Vermont bike shops. Um, some utilities offer point of sale rebates, which means the, the customer gets uh, the rebate discounted right at, at the point of sale. And um, others are reimbursable. Not many other utilities in the US offer rebates for e-bikes. So Vermont is a leader on this in many ways. Um, however, as I mentioned earlier, most e-bikes found at local shops cost at least $2,000. And with that high a price point is likely that many of these utility rebates are going to hire wage earners since the cost will still be a barrier to adoption for lower income Vermonters, even with a $200 rebate. Um, preliminary research shows us that e-bike rebates are more successful when larger portions of the population have access to both a larger e-bate rebate and access to different kinds of e-bikes. And so we think that incentive providers should avoid imposing limitations on the types of e-bikes that can qualify for such rebates, such as those direct to consumer brand e-bikes that can be purchased online. Um, so there's also a forthcoming 200 point of sale rebate incentive from the state level. Um, so far, this program's only funded for one year for 2022 with $50,000 providing 250 e-bike rebates. As far as we know, this rebate will be stackable with those utility incentives um, and will likely be able to be used for online purchases. Although, of course, those online purchases won't, uh, be, won't have that point of sale rebate. It'll, it'll have to be reimbursable. Old Spokes Home, a bike shop in Burlington, also provides special financing for e-bikes. At Old Spokes, income qualified individuals can get subsidized pricing on their e-bike models through uh, their Everybody Bikes program. Two Vermont credit unions, Opportunities Credit Union and BESCU provide 0% or low percentage financing for qualifying customers seeking a loan to purchase an e-bike for transportation. Um, and lastly, at the federal level, there is a potential e-bike tax incentive in the Build Back Better bill, which of course we all know is still making its way through Congress. Um, so lots of, lots of different programs, financial opportunities to support e-bike adoption. Um, and so now I'm gonna turn it over to Linda, uh, a Vermont state president for AARP, who will talk a little bit about e-bike ridership trends. Um, in other words, who rides e-bikes and why they ride e-bikes. So take it away, Linda. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me okay, Eliana? Yep, okay. So this is the storytelling portion of our presentation. And uh, with this particular uh, area, you may have heard that e-bikes enable riders to travel greater distance with more ease. And just as a reminder, these aren't motorcycles, they're e-bikes. There is some effort involved in riding an e-bike. You need to pedal to get going. And depending on the e-bike model, you need to continue pedaling, but with assistance. Next slide, please. So with uh, e-bikes, and as we age as adults, uh, we need to continue with cardiovascular exercise. I was out spinning this morning. And so if done correctly, bike riding doesn't put stress on aging muscles, bones, or joints. And I think the thing to remember is that even short rides for exercise and that exercise in small increments adds up. Bike riding improves your balance and who doesn't enjoy getting out breathing the fresh air? Next slide. 
My husband and I recently participated in the Tour de Farms ride in Verchans. We rode regular bikes for the 39 miles. Several folks rode bikes like those pictured or that pictured and other e-bikes. When we finished our ride, my husband and I were spent. The e-bike riders, well, they were ready for the after party. Okay, next slide. Statistics say that riding bikes can help fight disease. Biking 20 miles a week reduces heart disease by 50%. Women who bike and walk just 30 minutes a day had lower rates of breast cancer. People with an active commute of just 30 minutes are half as likely to suffer heart failure. Next slide. Now in this particular slide, note the two different barriers here. For folks who are over 55, like myself, it's more about recreation and exercise and overcoming medical barriers. For people under 55, it's about being able to replace car trips that require cargo uh, carrying and taking kids to school as uh, Eliana was just mentioning. Next slide. While you see here in this photo, a rear cargo e-bike, my adult kids have had a front bucket e-bike since their kids were young. They still take my grandkids to school and outings around town for long rides in their hilly section of Austin, Texas, uh, where uh, e-bikes are easily obtainable. Um, we actually uh, rented an e-bike for three days there and they have protected bike lanes in and around the city and, and uh, lake. And anecdotally, a biking, biking programs that Local Motion has partnered with AARP bike riders, the number one concern by seniors in biking is the lack of protected lanes. So we need better protect, protected bike lanes. Jonathan, you're up next. Protected bike lanes, you're speaking my language, Linda, thank you. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, planning for e-bikes. As the slide says, it's um, a lot of the same, but also there, there are some key differences. Uh, next, Eliana. So, um, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time talking about, um, you know, EVs, electric vehicles, and electric cars in particular about a way to address um, the climate crisis. Um, I think it's important to recognize that at the moment, the market is telling us that folks are really interested in e-bikes. They're out selling electric cars in the US actually by uh, more than two to one. Next slide. And um, when you look at the uh, per kilometer emissions of these different modes, um, you know, you'll see e-bikes are very low. They're, they're close to light rail or a typical bike. Um, whereas, you know, electric cars are are fairly high. So, you know, when we talk about trying to address climate crisis, reducing emissions, e-bikes, you know, per kilometer are a much better sell than electric cars. And of course, they also don't come with all the externalities of cars like requiring parking, development issues, um, and all the numerous health impacts we can go on and on. So there are a lot of benefits to encouraging e-bike adoption that we've been talking about. And um, on the climate front, they're also a really important thing for us to be supporting in a much bigger way than we are now. Um, next slide. A new report shows that the fastest growing form of electronic vehicle is the e-bike, which is particularly popular in cities. At this point, experts believe the only thing that could slow these bikes down are car doors. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, Michael Che from SNL. Um, A new report shows. Pretty much, it's all good. Pretty much hit the nail on the head. Uh, really, you know, the, the key thing, as Linda mentioned, is really infrastructure. You know, people recognize that e-bikes um, address those issues of distance between destination and terrain. Those barriers have really been removed by e-bikes. So uh, the primary remaining barrier really is this issue of a need for safe infrastructure. And all these new riders that are getting on bikes are creating a lot of new demand for, for that kind of safe, protected infrastructure um, that, that folks want to be able to get out and use and get to where they're going. Next. So um, in addition to you know, that, that need for just generally better protected infrastructure, um, slower streets, safer streets, 
Um, there's going to be, you know, a real increase in demand, I think, for, you know, regional infrastructure. So the, the image on the right is um, that's the multi-use path between um, through Colchester on Route 15 that's being constructed right now. I think it's unfortunately not going to be completed until next summer now. Um, but this kind of regional infrastructure is going to take on, we think, you know, really added importance with e-bike popularity because folks are going to be able to make trips between communities in a pretty easy and efficient way as long as we can build out that infrastructure for them. Next. So just, just some small nuances here that I think are important to, to cover. And, and these are things, you know, there's not a ton of research on this yet. So a lot of this is anecdotal from folks that we talk to who ride e-bikes around all the time and also from our own experience riding e-bikes. Um, there is a risk in, in drivers sort of misjudging approach speed of e-bikes. Um, they often don't realize that, you know, it's, it's an e-bike that someone is on. And they assume that the approach speed is the same as a, you know, a typical bike. Um, and so if they're looking in their mirror, they're about to take a right turn, they see a bike coming up behind them on the shoulder or in the bike lane. Oftentimes that driver will, will think that it's going to take longer for the bike to get to that intersection than it does. And that creates, you know, increased risks of right and left hooks and T-bones. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a bit of um, recalibration that needs to have there, happen there in terms of, you know, how fast people think bicycles are traveling. Um, there's also um, a sense that, you know, riders are often more comfortable taking the lane if they're on e-bike because, you know, they can ride at a higher speed with more ease, which means they can keep up with traffic and not feel like they're slowing things down or frustrating drivers. So people are more confident taking the lane. Um, and poor shoulder conditions really encourage this, right? If, if you've got a bike lane, that's great. But if it has potholes throughout it, you know, especially someone on e-bike who's riding faster is not going to want to deal with those potholes because hitting one going 20 miles an hour uh, does not feel very good. So those riders are, are more uh, likely to be, you know, in the, in the shared use lane. Um, we also see, you know, riders um, on e-bikes are traveling faster oftentimes, and that means that they have uh, less reaction time in a door zone. Door zones, you know, if you're not familiar with that term, basically if you have a, a you know, a row of parked cars, um, and then a bike lane right next to those parked cars, drivers who are exiting the cars are opening their doors into the bike lane. That's a serious hazard for people riding. It's why we try to not put bike lanes in door zones. Um, and e-bikes really um, increase the importance of not putting those bike lanes in the door zone because riders on e-bikes have a shorter reaction time to swerve out of the way. Um, we also know that, you know, folks who are uh, ride e-bikes loaded up with kids often have a different riding style. There's a preference for more separate infrastructure and they're willing to sacrifice some speed or sort of directness of route um, in order to use that, that more separated, safer feeling infrastructure. So uh, bike parking is uh, key you know, for, for both e-bikes and for traditional bikes. But, you know, with, with e-bikes, it takes on even more importance because these are expensive bikes often, um, and they're also heavy. So it, it's really important, you know, that the, that the racks we provide um, have, you know, can, can have two points of contact with the bike frame. So the examples here are, you know, a wave rack on the left and a wheel bender rack on the right. These generally cannot provide two points of contact with the bike frame. Um, and they often result in really inefficient use of the space, as you can see on the left, uh, they can cause damage to the bikes. Um, so these are really types of racks that we need to avoid. Next. So what we want to look for, as you can see in this photo here, are you know, uh, racks that provide two points of contact with the bike. So as you can see in the photo, these, you know, the ones used here are um, hoop racks or U-style racks uh, or staple racks. Um, so these provide two points of contact with the frame, which helps to stabilize the bike and also makes it possible to securely lock the bike uh, and hopefully one of the wheels as well um, to the rack. Shelter also takes on um, much greater importance because especially for folks who are arriving at work after a long ride or parking their bike outside of the rack at home, um, it's, it's really important for that user to be able to remove their battery and bring it inside to charge if they need to. Um, but if there's any kind of precipitation happening, um, it's not going to be a good thing for the bike for that battery to be removed and exposed to the elements. But the shelter provides the, you know, the, the potential for the user to bring that battery inside, regardless of if it's raining or snowing. Um, so shelter is key. Next slide. 
so cargo bikes are big. You know, we we definitely they they need more space at racks. Um, so sort of the I think the short term solution to look for um, is you know where we have a row of hoop racks. Uh, municipalities or you know uh, property owners can consider designating the hoops that are on the outside as cargo bike parking. That um, that can be done with signage or with a stencil. Um, but you know, longer term, there are going to be you know more specific rack options for e-bikes. Um, those are shown here, and, and there are some available on the market now. Um, and you know, even using uh, just traditional hoop racks, providing a bit of extra space, another two feet, um, is is a good option as well. Next slide. So we're going to get into some of the um, regulations that were that are on the books right now in Vermont. There was a bill passed over the summer that um, updated Vermont's e-bike uh, statute. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about what was in there. Next slide. So um, just the basics in order to qualify as an electric bicycle in Vermont, it's gotta have fully operable pedals. Um, e-bikes are governed as bicycles under Vermont law, which means that riders must follow the same rules of the road as someone on a traditional bike. Um, and operators of e-bikes are considered vulnerable users, just like um, operators on traditional bikes. Um, electric bikes are not considered motor vehicles. Uh, so if you've got a sign on a path that says no motor vehicles allowed, that does not mean that e-bikes are prohibited. Um, e-bikes are not subject to registration, inspection, title license, or financial requirements. And next slide. So the new legislation, the sort of the primary thing that it did was classify um, e-bikes in Vermont using the sort of industry standard three-class system. Um, but we also maintained the motor-assisted bicycle classification, which, um, which captures some of the e-bikes that are out there that otherwise wouldn't fit into the three classes. Next slide. So this table sort of shows um, what those three classes look like. Um, so class one, two, and three are sort of the industry standard classes. Most of the e-bikes that are being produced now fall into one of those three classes. Um, so a class one e-bike is pedal assist only, meaning that it does not have a throttle. That pedal assist cuts off at 20 miles an hour. Um, class two e-bike has a throttle and usually also has a pedal assist. Um, and the assist also cuts off at 20 miles an hour. A class three e-bike cannot have a throttle. Those are pedal assist only, uh, but the assist goes up to 28 miles an hour. All three of the e-bikes that fall into the three class system uh, are limited to 750 watts. Um, and then class three e-bikes, uh, users have to be 16 or older to operate. Um, motor assisted bicycles can have a pedal assist or a throttle or both. Um, they are limited to 20 miles per hour under throttle, but there is no pedal assist limit. Um, they are limited by power to 1,000 watts. They're not permitted on sidewalks, and users must be at least 16 to operate them. Next slide. So um, the, the bill passed over the summer um, also sort of laid out how uh, managing agencies or municipalities can regulate uh, e-bike access on paths. So class one and two e-bikes can pre be prohibited if there's a safety reason or if there's a need for compliance with other laws or legal obligations, this does require notice and public hearing for class one and two e-bikes specifically. Um, motor assisted bicycles and class three e-bikes can be prohibited from paths without that notice hearing or justification sort of that public process. Next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit about whether or not uh, e-bikes should be prohibited from paths um, and some of the user conflicts that uh, folks are hearing about and dealing with and some of the management best practices. Next slide. So first off, you know, I think it's important to sort of contextualize this and, you know, what is the scale of the conflict that we're seeing and is it, are there real significant conflicts that are happening out there on our infrastructure that are caused by e-bikes? Or is this more of sort of a moral panic associated with a new technology? Um, so at the moment, you know, the conflicts between vulnerable users, meaning, you know, people on e-bikes and pedestrians or people on e-bikes and traditional bikes or whatever, these are generally anecdotal. We don't have a lot of data to support, you know, whether or not these are happening. Um, but, you know, also anecdotally, there don't seem to be any major consequences from these conflicts, you know, in Vermont at least. Um, we're not hearing about a lot of injuries happening. We're not hearing about 
um, just generally uh, really a lot of problematic behavior that's happening. Um, this seems to be a pretty minor issue, if at all. Um, and I think it's important to remember that, you know, municipalities need to prioritize um, addressing these conflicts against, you know, roadway safety issues, which, you know, there's a lot of solid data to inform uh, how we would respond to those issues. Um, and those issues also are causing frequent death and injury. So, you know, yes, we may be getting some reports from folks who are concerned with e-bikes on the past, but we have to remember that there are real safety issues that our municipalities need to address on our streets. And that's where we should be keeping our focus right now. Um, also important to remember that, you know, almost none of these conflict issues or really none of them um, that we're gonna discuss a little bit are, are unique to e-bikes. Next slide. So um, one potential conflict area is on sidewalks, right? And you can certainly imagine um, a dangerous situation arising if you have you know, an e-bike and a pedestrian uh, sort of meeting in a restricted sidewalk area, like on this, you know, the route for the, the exit 14 uh, overpass, which is shown here. I think the important thing to consider here is like, how would we address that, right? And why is that person on a bike or on an e-bike on the sidewalk? And I think the way to figure that out is to ask what's happening on the other side of the curb, right? Is there bike infrastructure for that user? And if there is bike infrastructure for that user, is it sufficient? So here we've got a faded painted bike lane uh, next to three lanes of fast moving traffic uh, with slip lanes crossing the bike lane. Um, so you can imagine why most users uh, on a bike are gonna be apt to take the sidewalk in this location and adopting an ordinance is not gonna stop or solve that behavior because users are weighing that against their, their safety. Um, and I think we, we shouldn't blame them for that. We should provide safe on-road infrastructure to provide a good alternative instead. Next. So when we look at shared use paths, um, some of the conflicts that I think, um, you know, parks and rec departments and towns are hearing about are generally issues around rider etiquette, right? So they're seeing higher speeds. Um, they're seeing that some close passing is happening, maybe unwarned passing. Um, and these are truly etiquette issues, right? Um, these, are, these are folks maybe who are new to path use because they're just getting into it because they got an e-bike and all of a sudden they feel comfortable, they have the ability to be out and about. Um, and so these are etiquette issues and um, we can address them through education. It's important to uh, recognize that these issues are also not unique to e-bikes, right? A, a fit rider on a traditional road bike can certainly reach 20 miles an hour and they can certainly make close passes and they can certainly do so without warning that they're making that pass. Um, so banning e-bikes from these facilities would not solve these issues because as we said, these are not unique to e-bikes. Um, and, and also there would be a huge loss if we were to ban e-bikes from these facilities because we know there are a lot of folks who are all of a sudden able to get out and ride as Linda was discussing who weren't able to otherwise who you know have had physical issues that have kept them off traditional bikes and so we really do not want to, you know, institute a ban that comes at the cost of the majority of users who are out there on e-bikes and, and behaving responsibly, um, just because there's a small minority who needs some education about how to behave responsibly. Next slide. So speed limits are something that's been considered, um, especially in Burlington, there was a lot of discussion around instituting a speed limit on the bike path. I think um, anytime we're talking about a speed limit, which is a, a legal regulation, we have to consider whether or not there are enforcement resources that would actually be put towards enforcing that speed limit. And if not, we shouldn't use a speed limit as an enforcement mechanism. Um, there are also some inherent problems with instituting a speed limit on a bike path. So first off, most bikes don't have speedometers. So there's no way for most users to know if they're abiding by a speed limit or not. Um, most bike paths also have, you know, a design in terms of the geometry of the bike path and the sight lines that permit speeds of 20 miles an hour and, and those speeds are totally safe um, at many times and in many places on a bike path. You know, we can certainly imagine on the Burlington waterfront, for example, there are times where it is not safe and appropriate to go 20 miles an hour when it's busy on a weekend when there are lots of folks and families out walking. And the vast majority of riders do slow down in those conditions. Um, but, you know, farther up the bike path, I live here in, in the new north end of Burlington, and I imagine this is the same on many bike paths in the state. 
you know, probably most times of day and most times of year, uh, it's totally safe to go 20 miles an hour because there, there's not a high volume of other users on the bike path. Um, so we shouldn't be instituting, you know, a, a speed limit that doesn't acknowledge that it's totally safe to go faster than that in, in a lot of cases. Um, finally, you know, I think the users who are out there riding recklessly are probably unlikely to abide to abide by a speed limit. Next up. So what is really the best practice? And, and this, is, this follows you know, recommendations from the Rails to Trails Conservancy, which is really the national leader in path developments and path management. Um, and, and Rails to Trails really talks about you know, not instituting bans, not trying to have speed limits, but, but really um, on paths, addressing conflicts through education. And there are some examples of those campaigns that have been done in the past. Um, at Local Motion, we're going to be working on some signage that can be used by municipalities. We'll be developing that over the winter. Um, when it comes to, to sidewalks and conflicts on sidewalks, again, I think it's important to look at improving the on-road bike infrastructure to actually provide a viable, safe alternative for uh, bikers and e-bikers. Um, and finally, as on streets, you know, if we're actually if we actually feel like we need to reduce speeds uh, somewhere on a bike path. The, the way to do that is through design. It's, it's not through instituting a speed limit. So next slide. And there are, there are examples of basically bike path traffic calming. Um, so this is uh, in Hopewell Junction, New York. Um, and what they've done is, you know, approaching an intersection, they have Splitter Island, which you can see, which basically narrows the, the bike path um, so that users slow down. And they also have a little bit of a curve built in, which also um, encourages users to slow down. Um, you know, these can be pretty expensive. They also create um, issues for plowing. So you'll notice they have a gate, I think, to provide alternative access and emergency access. So that's something that's important to consider if you're looking at doing something like this. Um, and I think it's also important to make sure that you're slowing down um, the correct user group. So if you have a path that's crossing a roadway and you want to slow down the path users, uh, you should first make sure that you shouldn't be slowing down the users on the roadway instead of the users on the path, right? Like, what are the volumes there? What does the engineering actually say about which user group should be slowing down and or stopping? And that is our last slide. Um, we've got some questions and I will field some of those. So um, Eliana, I think this, this first one's for you. Um, Darren asked, is Locomotion considering adding e-bike lending library locations and how can municipalities help make that happen? Um, thanks for your question, Darren. So uh, yeah, we are, we are absolutely considering adding some. We did get um, year two funding from our um, MTI grant, which is um, from the Vermont Agency of Transportation to set up three new locations. Um, the, I'm kind of in the process right now of building out criteria for communities for that. Um, I'm kind of looking at, uh, their capacity and if they've worked with us before. Um, so I would say kind of be on the lookout for that. Um, another opportunity we have for communities is our traveling e-bike lending library, which is a little bit of a low, a lower lift. Um, that's where we work with communities around the state um, that host a fleet, of, a small fleet of our e-bikes for five or six weeks at a time so that people in their communities can try them out for a couple days at a time. Um, so um, I know our website is uh, it, a little unclear right now, but working on um, getting some forms out uh, for people who are interested in that. So um, I hope that helps answer your question, Darren. Great, thanks, Eliana. Um, let's see. I think you kind of covered this, but could you talk a little bit about the the prices in Vermont for e-bikes after rebates and credits, and maybe just talk a little bit more about how those rebates work? Yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned in that that price slide. Um, most bike shops you go to, e-bikes are going to be at least $2,000, but probably more. Um, so we have a couple of e-bikes in our lending library, like a Trek e-bike is around $2,700, 2800 um, That green specialized e-bike that I talked about are, is in the 
32 to 3400 so um you know with a with a rebate uh you might be around 3k for that specialized bike or 2500 for that trek e-bike um and yeah so the the way that those work and you know in burlington if you go to a local shop they will apply that discount right at checkout and um we work with burlington electric to process those uh, rebates later on um other electric utilities you have to buy the e-bike fill out a form and send the receipt to that provider to get kind of a reimbursement of that 200 or 100 dollars um so i i Hope that answers that question about the rebates and credits. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so David asked, um, can e-bikes, especially cargo bikes, be locked when they're freestanding? Um, so I, I can take that one. So uh, a lot of a lot of e-bikes, or some e-bikes at least, do come with um, what I think a lot of people call a cafe lock. Um, which is basically an integrated lock that's part of the frame and which basically keeps the rear wheel from spinning. Um, and so, yes, the, the bikes that have those can be locked when they're freestanding, um, but not all e-bikes have those. Um, and it's not, you know, that type of lock is not really a long-term solution. It's it's hard to, you know, pick up and walk away with a cargo bike, but it's, it's certainly possible. So, you know, you, you want to have you know, a permanent fixed object to lock that bike to if you're leaving it out for any period of time. But certainly if you've got, you know, a bucket bike and um, you're just, you know, parking it to, to run into your cafe, then a cafe lock is probably um, sufficient. Um, let's see. So Will Dodge asked, um, is it ever legal for an e-bike to use a sidewalk such as where there is no shoulder on a highway or where there is imminent danger to a cyclist? So, so Will, it, um, the, the only e-bikes that are not allowed on sidewalks throughout the state are uh, the, class, the class three e-bikes and the motor assisted bicycles. So class one and class two e-bikes are allowed on sidewalks unless there are local regulations um, that say otherwise. Um, let's see, what else do we have for questions here? David asked, uh, which type of drive is more impervious to water and weather? I don't know, Eliana, do you have any thoughts on that one? Um, you know, I, I can't say for certain, so don't quote me on this, but my inclination is to say that hub motors are probably a little safer just because all the components are wrapped in that that casing, um, the mid drive motors tend to have um, like little openings at the bottom, I think like as a fan to get the heat off of them. Um, so, you know, grime and stuff, dirt certainly gets in those and can uh, potentially cause issues. Um, but uh, both, both styles are designed to be able to be ridden in weather for sure. So that's my best guess. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see, we had um, Nick Anderson asked, is it clear to an e-bike owner what class they have? Um, so right now, um, it, probably not for, for a lot of e-bike owners. Um, you know, they're the, on the national level, there's been, you know, a lot of states have uh, instituted labeling requirements and Vermont's new legislation actually does have a labeling requirement, but it didn't go into effect or I think it goes into effect on January 1st of uh, 2022. So I think more bikes are going to be coming with la with labels and there will be more awareness of what class of bikes folks have um, going into the future. Yeah, and just I would say you know, on all of our bikes, our e-bikes have um, a classification sticker that are kind of around where like the shop sticker is or that sort of thing. So they're not super blatant, but most of the time in my experience, they have been there. So. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's not, it's, you know, certainly folks can contact the manufacturer if, if they aren't sure what class of bike they have. And um, and manufacturers should certainly be able to tell them. Um, Dave, Dave asked, um, basically said that, uh, 
some insurance providers are not covering class two e-bikes on club rides because they consider class two e-bikes as motor vehicles because the motor alone might be used. So how do we address insurance coverage issues? Uh, I, that's not really something we've dealt with. Um, so I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. It's, you know, it hasn't, it's not an issue for us. <laughs> Um, we, you know, we don't do a lot of rides. So I don't know if there's a specific issue to organizations putting on rides that's related to that. Um, but, you know, I, th I think insurance providers are still sort of getting on the same page as states with regard to, you know, whether or not e-bikes are motor vehicles. Um, so my hope is that a lot of those sort of differences between, you know, insurance providers that don't consider an e-bike uh, to be a bicycle and state laws that that do consider them to be bicycles sort of get sorted out so that the insurance and the state statute are aligned better than they are now. Um, I don't know, Eliana, have you heard anything about insurance issues with regard to class two bikes specifically? Not specifically. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, has any consideration been given to offer a rebate for a regular bike in addition to e-bikes as this is also better than using a car? Uh, also, why is the rebate good for only one household or does each person get a rebate? Um, I can so, part of it. Yeah, take, take it away on the rebate on the household question. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I wasn't sure about the household. I Mm, I think it is mostly one per household, although it might be different depending on the utility provider. Um, but what I was going to say about the first part of your question, um, there is a program that's under development at the state level called Replace Your Ride um, that will, it's kind of a version of cash for clunkers in which people turn in their old gas guzzling cars and um, will be able to use the money they get in return for that for any kind of sustainable transportation option. So it could be used to purchase an e-bike or a regular bike and the gear that goes with them, or it can be used to purchase transit passes. Um, so along with that $200 incentive at the state level that I mentioned that replace your ride program is forthcoming. I don't know, Jonathan, you sound like you had something to add to that. Well, no, I, that was a great answer. I think um, I, I was going to say that, you know, I think there are a lot more programs um, in Europe that do provide rebates for bicycle purchases generally. I think it would be great to include those here. Um, you know, I think there may be something about the mechanics of how the way the, the utility rebates are administered that, um, made e-bikes possible where regular bikes might not be possible, but um, I'm not totally sure on that, but it's, it's a great point. I think, you know, I would love to see, you know, anyone who's buying any, buying any type of bicycle um, to be able to get a rebate on it. Um, let's see. So uh, Tim Clark asked, is it still true that rebates are only good for e-bikes that are purchased in Vermont and not online? Uh, Tim, yes, that is still true. Although, as far as we know, the forthcoming state incentive will be able to be used for online purchases. Um, the only caveat is that it will not be point of sale. There's no way to really work with um, online brands to offer a point of sale rebate, but um, it seems like the state incentive will be able to be used for those online purchases. Yeah, thank you, Eliana. Um, so there's a question about uh, if we know how big the cost incentives will be in the Build Back Better bill. Um, I do not know. Have you seen anything about that? I feel like I saw something in a New York Times article that said $900, but it's also might be percentage based too, right? So, um, Sounds like it's gonna be more than what um, our state and utility providers can offer, which is good. And hopefully like the EV electric vehicle incentives, it will be stackable. So, um, you know, adding up 900 plus that 400, you know, that does make a dent in the cost. So um, 
that that's what I've seen. I but you know I don't think that that number is finalized yet. Yeah, I don't know how worthwhile it is to uh, to predict where that'll all shake out. Yeah. Um, well, I think we covered all of the questions. Um, you know, folks, we're, we really appreciate you all coming out. If, if you have more questions, you know, you're, feel free to send them to, to me or to Eliana. Um, our, our emails are on the Local Motion website. Um, we would be happy to chat with you some more. Um, really hope this was uh, helpful. You are going to be receiving um, in the follow-up email a document that's got um, all kinds of information about the specific rebates, about the programs that are available to support e-bike adoption, um, and also um, links to the Vermont statutes that um, are sort of governing e-bikes in Vermont. Um, so thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you to Linda especially for joining us today, and uh, we hope to see you next time.